Haskins amaze me always. I can't thank you enough for being here. My name is Jane Clev, and I'm the head of the group Bold Nebraska. Um, we are so proud today to have Senator Whitehouse here, who is a climate champion. Many of you may have seen in the late hours on C-SPAN a couple weeks ago for the Climate All-Nighter. So we have a pretty packed schedule, and I'm going to just give a one-minute remark and then actually have people as soon as I'm finished, look to the back of the screen to show a quick video of our barn, and then we're going to start our speaking program. But I wanted to say a couple things first about where we're at. TransCanada has no legal route in our state. And that is because, that is because of everybody in this room. So they can't condemn landowners' property for their export pipeline, and we don't see a path for the president to legally approve a pipeline without a route in Nebraska. So we are in a very strong position, we always have been. And I think when we see polls that tell us that we are the minority, we know that we did not get in this fight because of a poll number. We got in this fight to protect our land and water. And we got in this fight for a simple fact of protecting our neighbors' rights. And there is no reason why we as Americans should allow a foreign corporation to seize American land for an export pipeline that's gonna do nothing to help us with energy independence. And today's program is all about climate change and showing that landowners, farmers and ranchers, citizens, can create and build our own energy. We don't have to rely on any big foreign corporation to do that. And so with that, let's give a look at this quick two-minute video. The one that makes me cry. It all starts with an idea. This one makes me cry. Stand up. Here we look at build a barn in the past. I can't see it. years to stop this pipeline. Um, so it's an amazing video and if you haven't seen the, the, your name uh, kind of scroll through, please definitely take a look at our YouTube page. I'm going to turn this over to Ken Winston who will then introduce Senator Whitehouse. Um, Ken is a hero for anybody who cares about climate and water and energy policy in our state. He is the head of the Sierra Club here and he is one of the best allies we have in not only fighting the pipeline but pushing for cleaner energy policies with our energy system. So Ken Winston. Thanks, Dave. Well, today's all about 
leadership, it's all about courage, it's all about finding solutions. And um, it, uh, as Jane indicated, and as that, that video indicated, the reason that, that the pipeline hasn't been built, the reason it's been stopped so far is because, is because of the engagement of so many of you, so many of us, on a daily basis, getting out there and speaking up and standing up. But today, uh, it gives me the great pleasure to introduce Senator Whitehouse. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse is from Rhode Island. Um, and he has been someone who has been speaking out regularly about climate change. And I know he does this on a weekly basis, gets up and talks about climate change in front of the Senate chamber. And he brings out points about climate change that a lot of people don't even think about, like the Im impact of climate change on sports. And sometimes people think of those things as being trivial, but they're things that people care about. And sometimes you have to do those kinds of things to get attention. And one of the other things that Senator Whitehouse has done, he's spoken out against the Keystone XL pipeline, pointing out that what, what a bad idea it is. There are, um, that there are visions of a better way as opposed to the, the bad ideas, the failed ideas of big oil. So it gives me the great pleasure to introduce Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. I want to thank you all for your passion and for your advocacy. I am traveling around because I am absolutely convinced that we are at the tipping point on climate change politically, that it is about to break our way in a big way, that we need to be optimistic, that we need to be confident, that we need to be relentless, and if we are, we can turn this thing, and we can turn it a lot sooner than people think. I taste it, I feel it, I know it, I see it, we can do this, it's gonna happen very, very soon. And an absolutely critical part of that fight to protect our climate and to battle against carbon pollution and the polluters that are not only compromising our atmosphere and oceans, they're compromising our American democracy. Their money is just as dirty as their oil. And we have got to is we got to stop the Keystone Pipeline. And I want you to know, I was at the Keystone Rally. I am uh, preparing to file comments against the Keystone Pipeline. We're in the last draft of an op-ed on the Keystone Pipeline. I think there is a very strong case to be made that the report that the State Department did clearing the Keystone Pipeline is fundamentally flawed, has deep holes and gaps in the logic, and actually they're truthful enough that if you dodge your way around the gaps and the traps, you actually find enough in that report to justify Secretary Kerry and President Obama rejecting the pipeline within the bad report as it's written. So, <laughs> I'm honored to be here with Jane Klebe and with uh, Randy Thompson and with a person who I very much hope will join me in the United States Senate, Dave Domina. Yeah. I've been doing a whirlwind tour of Iowa with State Senator Rob Hogue, who is passionate and relentless and determined and is changing things in Iowa. So let me turn it over to State, Iowa State Senator Rob Hogue. Hey, is this guy great? Uh, first of all, just because I'm from Iowa, any Iowans in the audience? Yeah! <laughs> Well, Senator Whitehouse has been uh, with us for two days in Iowa because Iowa is, as we know, the political center of the universe. <laughs> and so for those of you uh, who are in Iowa, thank you so much for being here. And, and, and not only on this fight on Keystone Pipeline, but we are going to win this fight against climate change and the fight for sustainability because it is the defining challenge of our generation. And I just want to thank you for being here, all of you for being here. I want, to, I want to say something about Randy Thompson. Uh, we wanted to do something on Keystone in, uh, in Iowa. So I started to ask around. Randy Thompson came over to Des Moines and Ames and did a couple programs. Attracted over 200 students at Iowa State University who said, 
all of them kind of on the way out. You know, we've never heard this before. Right? Fantastic message. Keystone is fundamentally wrong. We cannot take the dirtiest fuel in the world, allow a foreign oil company to take our land to endanger our water so they can make more money selling it on the global market. There is nothing international interest about that. There are so many levels it's wrong. Uh, a Republican state representative, I happen to be a Democrat, the two of us went together in February, we submitted comments uh, to the uh, to our, our congressman, sent, sent those in to uh, the State Department to say, this is not in our national interest. It is wrong to have Americans like the people in Nebraska have to face that threat. But I also want to just tell you more generally on the climate issue, uh, you know what? There's not, did any of you ask for this problem? No. Did, any, who, did any of you 30 years ago say, you know what I'd like to do is burn a lot of fossil fuels and change the climate of the planet? <laughs> no, none of you did that. None of us did. But just like prior generations of Americans have had to face challenges, have had to face challenges not of their choosing, this generation of Americans needs to face this challenge because our people and our property are at risk because of climate change. I know, I know that some of you probably experienced a little bit of hardship in the flood of 2011. I would guess that. I came out, I saw Council Bluffs, I saw the damage, I saw Interstate 29, I heard the people speak at the forums. And the reason I did that is because in 2008, my city that I represent, Cedar Rapids, which had a previous flood stage of 21 feet on the Cedar River, that flood went over 31 feet, 5,000 homes had to be evacuated, 1,000 businesses, virtually every major facility of city and county government, nonprofits, churches. And when you experience a disaster like that, Climate change is no longer an abstract philosophical issue, it is a reality. And all this story does until we act is get worse. So the good news is, you saw it on, you saw it on the barn, you see it in the wind turbines that we saw earlier today, you saw it at the ethanol plant we toured earlier today. We have the solutions in this country we can say no to Keystone. We can say no to fossil fuels. We can say yes to the clean, renewable energy future we need. And we can do what this generation of Americans has been called to do. So I want to thank you all for being here. And I want to thank Senator Whitehouse for coming out and visiting. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to <laughs> Jane. <laughs> are Randy Thompson and Dave Domina and as they come up I'm just going to say a few words about each of them and so neither of them need any introduction if you two gentlemen can come up on stage with me uh, this group knows these two men they have been with us shoulder to shoulder since the beginning um, they're there when the cameras aren't there which is the most important thing when you when you look to leaders um, Randy was a landowner in the path of the pipeline. They tried to avoid him, hoping that that would shut him up, but that definitely has not shut him up. And uh, Dave Domina is the only person in the state of Nebraska that could have beat Dave Heineman in our court system about an unconstitutional <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. I'm surprised at the size of the crowd. That's kind of a thing. I'd be speaking to four ten people here today. So. <laughs> uh, kind of short on time, so I'll get right to it. But you know, if any of you have ever heard me speak before, I'm sure you realize that I've been very frustrated and disappointed with our uh, legislature and our governor. And uh, Amen. Yeah. So all this frustration. Uh, I decided today I would uh, approach this in a little different way. 
And so I sat down and I uh, comprised a list, a top ten list, <laughs> of my most frustrating moments uh, with the Keystone XL debacle. All right. <laughs> All right. One of my first, uh, number ten on the list <laughs> is when I contacted the governor's office asking him for help and information because we had received a letter from TransCanada threatening to take our property through eminent domain. He sent me back a nice colored brochure telling me about the pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> Number nine on the list was attending my county, Merritt County Board, meeting after they had uh, agreed to sign a letter of support for the Keystone XL pipeline. When we got out there, we found out they did not have a clue what they were supporting. They knew nothing about the pipeline. And their only source, the one and only source of information, was Mr. Jeff Rao, TransCanada's representative. <laughs> Number eight on my frustrating list is when we turned in a complaint, myself and several other landowners, to the Attorney General's office complaining about the treatment we had received from TransCanada, how they had bullied us and tried to intimidate us, and that meeting resulted in no action whatsoever. Number seven on my list was watching the governor and the legislature continually duck their responsibility to pass some critically needed pipeline siting and regulatory legislation. And then promptly exempting TransCanada from the regulations that were passed in the special session. Number six, and this is probably one of my favorites, really. <clears throat> this is a good one. This was hearing Senator Carlson explain to landowners that the threatening letters they had gotten from TransCanada were really just uh, informational letters. <laughs> <laughs> and that we should really be grateful because TransCanada was just giving us an advance notice of what they were going to do to us. <laughs> That's <honestly> down <laughs> <laughs> Number five on my list, and this one is to me was totally outrageous, was seeing my fellow Nebraskans being reduced to tears after being mocked and belittled by Senator McCoy and other committee members when these good citizens went to testify before the Natural Resource Committee. This should not be happening in our state. Yeah. Yeah. Number four on my list, and these are somewhat in chronological order, they're not necessarily, not greatly affected me, was watching Senator Christensen as he introduced a bill that would legalize trespassing for companies like TransCanada so they could come on to your property and do survey work without your consent. And thank God we had enough people there that he withdrew the bill right there at the hearing. Yes. Number three on my list, and this was a big one, was watching Nebraska lawmakers throw the landowners of Nebraska under the bus with the passage of LB 1161. Boo! <laughs> yes. Number two on my list was witnessing the lack of attendance of our elected officials at any of the hearings yeah. that the State Department or the DEQ held here in Nebraska. They're making critical issues affecting our livelihoods and yet they can't take the time to come out and listen to what we have to say about it. That's that's uh, negligence of duty right there. Yeah. Yep. Okay.
And now we're down to my number one frustrating thing. I'm sure some of you will agree with me on this one. And that is the number one frustrating thing is listening to Lee Terry. <laughs> to uh, put together a, a top 10 list of gratifying experiences. Yeah. But you know what? I couldn't find that many. But we have had a few. One for me, and I'm sure for all of you, has been watching all the efforts by Trans Canada and the politicians to short circuit the process and every time they've done it, they shot themselves right in the foot, and it's delayed their project even more. And that is bad. And of course, the one thing that was tremendously gratifying was when we won our lawsuit. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't go without saying. There's two really good reasons that that happened. One of them is named David Dominer. <laughs> they always have my gratitude, believe me. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, somebody who knows how to talk. <laughs> This is Brian Jordy. I'll talk today, but I'll speak for both of us for a little bit. We are involved in this law lawsuit against the governor and the Trans-Canada Pipeline issue for a really, really simple to articulate reason. There are some things that are worthy of politics, some things that are appropriate for politics, and there are some easy to define things that are not. And those things that are not appropriate to politicize are fundamental needs that each of us have, like water, yeah. yep. and food, mm -hmm. and land, yep. and the right to own it, and enjoy it, and to be free of intimidation over its use. Those are not political issues. The United States Geological Survey has graphically portrayed the available water resources of the Earth by showing what all of the water sucked up into a cube would look like, not only on the surface of the Earth, but beneath the Earth. It's a three-cube sequence. The first cube with all of the water, salt water from all of the oceans and the otherwise, would occupy a cube that is 860 miles in dimension. It would fit between Indianapolis and Denver. The second cube is all of the fresh water on Earth. And that cube is 260 miles in dimension, and it would fit very comfortably in the state of Iowa. And the third cube is all of the drinking water available on Earth, including beneath the Earth, and that cube is 27 miles in size, and it would occupy less than half of the land mass of Senator Whitehouse's home in Rhode Island. Wow. That's what we're fighting for. Yeah. 140 years ago, and in some cases more recently, many more recently, but some that long ago, Nebraska landowners acquired title to tracts of land in this state, and they farmed them year after year, generation after generation, and passed them on, or sold them to somebody else who cherished them as much. And throughout that time, making annual income after annual income to support a family, they were at, at liberty to use that land in an intelligent, and sensible 
and responsible way that exhibited the stewardship that only someone who comes from the land and loves the land knows that it needs. <laughs> then three things happened. First, a foreign corporation that wants to make a daily profit came along and it encountered, an, it encountered a governor who doesn't understand the land. And it married up with a majority in the legislature that was seduced by big oil. And that needed to stop. In 1895, our predecessors in this state depoliticized pipelines and railroads and grain elevators and taxi companies and truckers and common carriers of all kinds against political favors because common carriers are needed by the common people, all of us, and those are not to be political issues. <laughs> so Randy and Susan and Suze, I have a forecast for you. There is a Friday morning coming in your future, and on that Friday morning your telephone will ring and I'll be on the other end of that telephone call. And I will say to you on that Friday morning, Randy, the Nebraska Supreme Court has affirmed the judgment of the District Court. You will win your appeal. <laughs> Nebraskans, stand together on this. We don't need big oil in our state pushing our people around. We don't need big oil threatening our elderly people who have ownership interests in land or lying about what they're going to do when they compensate people or putting easements together that leave pipelines left in the land when they're finished with them and they're used up or allow them to separate a person's well from their irrigation system or their driveway from their livestock or their house from their lane or anything else we can get along just fine with honest and honorable people who know how to be neighbors, and TransCanada doesn't know how. Thank you. here with me and bring up three landowners who actually have clean energy projects on their property and they're going to give a brief description of what they have on their property and why they did that and so the three people are Graham Christensen many of you know who used to be with the Farmers Union who's now going over to the Dave Domina campaign Dan Cluthy who is a farmer and a hog producer and is actually a candidate for MPPD which is just awesome and Jenny Harrington who uh, families land the uh, the uh, clean energy barn so many of you have seen her uh, as you were helping kind of put those nails in that wood um, the first person I'll have speak is Graham and then Jenny will follow and then we'll close with Dan and Abby's coming up too which is just awesome <laughs> My story today is about the answer to these kind of problems. And that is what all of our stories will be. Through all of this, more and more folks are looking at ways that we can become energy independent. And in, in the scenario that I want to talk about, just one hour north of the, of the city of Omaha in Burke County, Nebraska, we're already so close to making our community almost energy independent. Um, I serve as the president of Burke County Wind Energy, and it is a little cooperative effort, a little LLC that has been put together of 22 farm families across, across our rural area. And this, this LLC has worked for five years to do all the little feasibility studies, the wildlife studies, the transmission studies, this working with the State Historical Society and all these little things to make sure that we have an area that we deem appropriate and safe to put a, a, a small wind farm uh, that would be locally owned. If this wind farm were to be developed, you would see wind being generated just under 50% of the time 
on our small sub-transmission lines that go around the entire Burke County area. Now, in June, we worked with Dale Hurt, the same solar developer that, that built the, the energy barn out on the pipeline route, and uh, we put a solar panel up at our farm, just a five kilowatt system up on a rooftop. And so when that wind isn't blowing any longer, then that point in time, a lot of times the sun is producing energy. They make such a good combination. Our farm will be being fueled by these solar panels on the sun. One year ago, my parents bought a, an electric car hybrid, a Chevrolet Volt. So theoretically, with this wind farm and this solar panel, we can now plug in our Chevrolet Volt into the charger in our garage and barely ever have to be reliant on foreign fuel sources. The energy will be generated right here at home in Nebraska for our community in Berkeley. And not only are we doing the right thing environmentally, we are bringing new revenues into a rural area that desperately needs it. In Nebraska, and I'm going to close with this because there's a very there's several other good stories here, but in Nebraska, with the third highest wind potential in the nation, and and right around number 10 in solar potential in the nation, we have an opportunity to be able to produce energy and do things in a way that that no other place in the country has, and 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 you're looking at the solution standing right here up the stage. And we should be proud of it. And every single one of you can do their little part to become more energy independent. So we no longer have to even think about relying on foreign multinational pipeline companies to fuel our energy sources in, in, this, in this state and country. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. It's great to see everybody here. Um, I just wanted to share the story about how the Clean Energy Barn came about. And um, our family farm is in York County in Nebraska. And um, in about 2008, my sister's um, family um, up by um, Central City, Nebraska, um, was contacted by TransCanada to say that a pipeline would be coming through their farm. And they could either sign the agreement or um, it would be taken by eminent domain. Um, because of the change in the route, with the concern over the fragile sand hills and the Ogallala Aquifer um, on the original route, um, the, the new route was changed about 20 miles to the east and now landed on my sister's um, inherited farm. Um, which I live on. So um, now the rest of the family is involved in the Keystone project. And so at that time, um, through the sharing of my sister, we learned a lot about the issues surrounding tar sands and a pipeline and what it would be um, through our land. So when the idea was presented to our family to build a clean energy barn, along the route of the Keystone Pipeline. We were so excited. Um, thought it was a great idea, a great shout out to the world to say, hey, we don't need this dirty fuel, this dirty energy. The world needs clean, renewable energy, and we're gonna show you how to do it. So, um, as you saw in the video, through um, a couple of weekends, people came from all over the United States. It was a beautiful thing to watch. There were students from Iowa University, there was a, um, families from Montana, Illinois, um, California. It was just incredible. I'd never seen anything like it. People just showed up in my mom's yard and started painting uh, billboards and asking what they could do to build this clean energy barn. It was truly a moving experience. And every time I hear that song that goes along with the video, it makes me cry. So um, such an uplifting thing to happen in the light of such a daunting, um, trying issue that we have um, upon our family right now with the proposed route going through our, our family's farm. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about um, why I feel it's so important to have the realization of how we need to move forward on renewable clean energy. In the span of the last 200 
um, years, the human race has been on a fast track to burn all the stored energy that was has taken over 80 million years to make. Yes, climate change is a natural process, but not the change in climate that we're seeing today. The change is on an unbelievable rate. Um, the increase in carbon in our atmosphere that has now surpassed 400 parts per million is unprecedented and and very frightening. Um, the one gift of the Keystone XL that was somewhat um, unexpected is the gift of the community that has been created from the people that have the concern over what is happening to our climate and dedicated to building the energy barn and to um, uplifting it and shouting out. Um, I just wanted to thank Senator Whitehouse. Um, we can't thank him enough for his visionary leadership on climate change. We need leaders like him. Um, conversations are happening daily about climate change. I agree with what he said today. We're just on the brink of moving forward on this issue. I feel the tide is turning and many, many more people are becoming aware of the impacts of climate change on their daily lives. My children will not inherit the farm that I did. Our nation's children won't inherit the country that their ancestors did. The world's children will not inherit the earth as we know it today. We must act now. Thank you. I'm Danny Luthi from uh, Dodge, Nebraska, and I was asked to, uh, I'm thankful for being here, I was asked to talk about a renewable energy project that I have. Uh, I'm a, a farmer, grain farmer, hog farmer, and uh, what I done was uh, uh, erected a uh, anaerobic digester which takes the animal waste and uh, uh, taken it down to the digester and uh, the bacteria in the digester uh, uh, breaks down the waste and, and brings up methane gas and what what I've been doing was uh, uh, using that methane gas to run a 3306 cat engine it runs a generator 24 7 to make electricity and <laughs> Uh, uh, Nebraska Public Power District buys it all and puts it back into the grid. Uh, and they say I, I have enough on my little hog operation to supply 53 homes for a year. Uh, but it really don't stop there. What this, uh, I call this a manure processing system, and all of the waste that goes through this manure processing system comes out odorless. So when we can take livestock waste like hog manure and make it neighbor friendly, that's economic development. <laughs> Every day I take this hog manure and I feed it to the digester and every day the hogs replace it. That's, that is renewable energy to the About one year ago, I learned to compress this methane into CNG tanks, and uh, methane is methane, whether it comes from the oil fields as natural gas or from livestock enterprise systems for waste as methane but uh, I, I've got a three-quarter ton Chevy Duramax diesel pickup that I run 80% methane, 20% diesel and I get 70 miles to the gallon. <laughs> percent diesel and I 
these uh, methane and 10% diesel in my uh, tractors, and they just purr. <laughs> so, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, I would like to see all waste, including municipalities, process their waste. And, uh, you know, we can utilize the gas for electricity, for propane, diesel. You know, all livestock enterprise systems can be energy efficient. Make their own electricity, make their own, replace their own diesel, propane, all from a byproduct, manure, all waste. <laughs> In 2013, the National Hog Farmer um, gave us the 2013 Environmental Steward Award National. With all of my renewable energy experience and the uh, stuff I bring to the board for the Brass Public Power District, I would love to be the new director in November. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to have everybody stay here because we're going to do a couple of questions and answer. And Senator Ho, come back up. Dave Domina, come back up. Randy, um, as they're coming back up and as you're thinking of your questions, just a couple of announcements. Um, you might know we're doing a Cowboy and Indian Alliance uh, week long of action in DC. The website is called Reject and Protect. Um, and we have a lot of folks in the room that have already signed up for that. If you haven't signed up, you can sign up on the Bold Nebraska website. Um, it's going to be an amazing week of actions of not only the tribes that are along the route, but farmers and ranchers and citizens that are fighting this pipeline. Uh, we're calling in our closing argument to the president. And so if you can make the time to come with us, we definitely want you there. Um, we have yard signs here if you need one, and uh, postcards if you haven't yet set a set or if you've already sent a set and you want to send another one, we have them in the back table, so definitely take some of those. Um, Dale Hurt, I just want to give a shout out, he's right here and he's shy, um, but he is a solar installer and he's the person, the genius behind putting the solar panels on our energy barn and I can't thank him enough for his service and his leadership. Thank you. two other candidates that are in the room actually since it's campaign season and these are for nonpartisan races. We have Ben Gottschall who's running for MPPD as well. <laughs> we have Paul Anderson who's also running for state senate. He's right there. <laughs> oh, and Matt Cronin who's running for OPPD here in Omaha. So, we have pipeline fighters who are not just making change in the street they're bringing change to the electoral system in the voting booth. And we, as pipeline fighters, have an opportunity to do that as well this year. We'll be able to vote for pipeline fighters in these nonpartisan races, which is amazing to me. We'll have real citizen politicians representing our views and really pushing renewable energy. And that is a very good step for our state. So with that, we'll take some questions from the audience, because I know you might have some questions for either the citizens who have renewable energy projects or anything about the pipeline. Hi. Hi. Uh, for Mr. Dama, can you speculate a little bit on the, the timeline for the appeal and then the basis for the appeal relative to the, all the original information and the initial decision that will that be a more limited scope to try to overturn the decision? The question, if I may restate it, is would I comment on the timing of the appeal to the Nebraska Supreme Court and essentially whether the issues will be narrower or of the same breadth as in the trial court. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Uh, three things have happened since February 19, since, uh, when the trial judge uh, ruled in the case. Uh, number one, the same day the Attorney General appealed the case to the Nebraska Court of Appeals, technically filed a motion which we consented to to move the case to the docket of the Supreme Court. We consented to that motion because the statute is clear that it's the responsibility of the Supreme Court to pass on questions of constitutionality. So it was clear it had to go there. The second thing that happened was that the Attorney General's office asked that oral argument be expedited. We did not oppose that motion because I practice in the Supreme Court regularly and I know its docket, 
and I knew that the court would expedite a constitutional question. That's simply the procedure in the Supreme Court. So I thought the motion was eyewash, and it was. The timing is somewhat shortened because it's a constitutional issue, uh, but the briefing schedule follows the filing of the record made in the trial court. The record in the trial court is due within 90 days of February 19. The Attorney General's brief is due within 30 days of that date, so March, April, May, that's June 19. Our brief is due by July 19. And in our brief, we have the right to cross appeal issues. I'll mention what that means in a moment. When that happens, when our brief is filed, the case goes on the argument calendar for the Supreme Court. Usually, the Supreme Court does not hear oral arguments in August. That's the only month the court routinely does not hear them. Uh, if they want to, they can hear it in August. They're the Supreme Court. Uh, but um, uh, it'll probably be argued in September. That's my best guess. After that, because they are the Supreme Court, uh, the decision date is entirely up to the court. That could be two weeks, two months, I had a case uh, that arose uh, in rural Nebraska and involved an issue of commercial law that was decided 19 months after argument. Recently, it was much less complex than this one, but it had a complex legal issue in it. Best prediction, it'll be two to four months after oral argument, and that's a guess. A word about the issues. Uh, the primary issue framed by the Attorney General's appeal is whether the Public Service Commission is the exclusive body to which decisions over pipelines can be given by the legislature. We will cross appeal a couple of issues that the trial judge ruled against us on. One of those is the question of committing the full faith and credit of the state to the funding of the environmental study. The way the statute is read, Nebraska's citizens have to advance the money for that study against the promise that the pipeline company will pay us back. Our argument is that's a pledge of our credit. Our Constitution prohibits a pledge of our credit, uh, and we will make the argument that that should not be permissible. The other issue that we will raise is whether this was special legislation. There are a couple of prongs to that argument. They're pretty technical, so I'll just leave it at that we will likely cross-appeal that issue. It's good to have multiple issues up on appeal. Can I make one more comment about the appellate process? In the Nebraska Supreme Court, friends of parties with legitimate things to say can ask the court for permission to file friend of court or amicus curia briefs. Uh, I think there is some national interest in filing a brief uh, on uh, the side of uh, the landowners here. Uh, I think that it's important for anybody with an interest in amicus curia briefs to recognize that we're dealing with an issue of state law. Is a state statute invalid under the state constitution? So anybody who wants to really be helpful wants to remember that the Nebraska Supreme Court is going to decide that question. It's not going to decide whether the pipeline is good or bad national policy. That's my answer. Yep, go ahead and ask your question back there. I'm not being facetious. I understand that when someone represents a foreign country, they have to actually register as a foreign agent. Lee Perry is not representing Nebraska. Can we do something about getting him to register as a foreign agent? I don't think we have that much power, unfortunately, but you can definitely express your opinion at the ballot box if you're one of his constituents. <laughs> What's going on in Canada? I mean, are there people up there fighting the pipeline or even develop the development of the tar sands? Yeah, um, I can say a few things and then Ken, I'm sure you can say a few things too. Um, there's always a new proposal on the table to get tar sands to the export market. One of the most recent ones that TransCanada is involved in is called the Energy East Pipeline. If you listen to TransCanada, just like if you listen to them on the Keystone XL, it's going to be approved any day and you know, tar sands will be flowing. 
if you listen to the First Nations, which is the tribes in Canada, or the citizens and towns along that route, um, they'll tell you that they're not giving permission for that pipeline to come through their town any day, uh, anytime soon. Um, so we don't see a huge expansion plan for the tar sands with all of the proposals that they have on the table. We do know that they're going to try to repurpose a lot of pipelines, which is kind of their plan B, which is dangerous in, it own, in its own set, and I could give a, a speech on that, but I won't. Um, but Canada is fighting very hard, just as much as Americans are fighting. Um, they don't think it's their, in their nation's interest to continue to use three barrels of clean water for one barrel of tar sands. That just doesn't make any sense. Um, not to mention 17% greenhouse gas emissions and from traditional oil, et cetera. So there's a very strong fight up in Canada. Um, and I think that they get very frustrated that they aren't represented by their elected officials um, with, with Prime Minister Harper. I just wanted to throw in one, one other additional point, and that's the fact that a lot of First Nations people, the native people of Canada, who uh, believe that, that many of their treaty rights are being violated by the tar sands process. We'll take two more questions. Yep. Uh, I just have a question about the first Keystone Pipeline. Um, I know when it went in, I can't even remember what year it was, but I was living in Stanton, and I didn't know it was coming until my landlady said something about it, and that there were going to, you know, there's going to be a lot of people, you know. Uh, the businesses in Stanton will appreciate the extra business and all that kind of stuff. And so what is the difference between the two pipelines? Yeah, so um, there is difference in diameter. So Keystone 1 carries about 530,000 barrels a day. Keystone XL would carry 830,000 barrels a day. So it's significantly bigger. Um, it crosses, Keystone XL crosses a sandier soil and obviously crosses much uh, shallower parts of the Ogallala Aquifer where our water is directly at surface. You know, the Keystone 1 pipeline got approved really within a six, about a six month process under President Bush. Um, and we've spoken to landowners who signed that contract. A lot of them have confidentiality agreements so they can't speak to the press. Uh, but they were told that it was a traditional crude oil pipeline. Some of them thought it was a natural gas pipeline. Some of them thought it was a water pipeline. There was lots of confusion. For landowners that were involved in that, they will tell you that there was no opposition like there is on Keystone XL. And so when, yeah, so when TransCanada would tell landowners, look, you're the last to sign, you better sign or we're taking you to court, they really did think that they were the last to sign because nobody else was talking about this. There was no uh, Nebraska Easement Action Team, which is headed by Dave Domina to help landowners with legal issues around the pipeline. Um, so it is a much different scenario now. Uh, we still have concerns with Keystone 1. Firefighters along that route aren't properly trained. Um, is you know, it tar sand oil also? It's tar sand oil uh, flowing with lots of chemicals that are mixed into it in order to liquefy it like benzene. So it's it's still concerning and we still have issues with that one and it's why we're trying to stop this one. But it did. It went in the ground without any of us knowing. Yeah. I'd like to address that just a little bit. Because uh, there seems to be a, a great misunderstanding, especially people, reporters and so forth, that come out here and they say, well, you know, we've already got the Keystone 1. Why is it different than the Keystone XL? Well, Jane touched on the big difference, and honest to God, our state really lucked out when Keystone 1 was placed where it was. And that was just by accident, because uh, TransCanada had a pipe up in Canada, I think was changed from natural gas to oil, and so they just ran it straight south across Nebraska. And luckily for us, where the Keystone 1 is, the water table is probably down about 150 to 200 feet. Now like on our property out in Merrick County, the water table is right there at the surface. And so when they would put the pipe in the ground, it would be actually be submerged directly in the water. So at least with the Keystone 1, we have that 150 to 200 foot barrier of clay soil before the oil gets into the water supply. And the XL, in many, many places where it was going to go, and still does, uh, it's going to be buried right in the water supply. That's a big difference of the other two. We'll take one more question over here. Uh, 
We've all heard about unintentional spills. Uh, I'm concerned about intentional spills where someone who wanted to do harm would use that to ruin our whole water source. Have you, what, what are your views of that? And I, ha I don't hear many people talking about it. Um, so the, we are not aware of a threat assessment that the State Department has done. Um, on intentional um, risk for the pipeline. We know that all pipelines would obviously carry some inherent risk of terrorism um, or intentional. Um, we are aware that there is a threat assessment report coming out. We don't know when it is going to come out, but we know the State Department failed to do that, and so uh, a private individual has funded a study and that that's going to happen. Um, so we look forward to reading that. I know a lot of our farmers and ranchers are concerned about that, especially where the pipeline goes near kind of fertilizer and other, um, you know, highly volatile, uh, you know, materials around farms and ranches. So it's a concern, and you're right, it hasn't been addressed properly. We'll take one more from Dale. Yeah. Yeah, Jay, I got a question on, uh, you know, I'm dealing with solar all the time, and everybody talks about subsidies, they want to subsidize it. Is TransCanada receiving subsidies? Taxpayers. So I don't know who wants to take that. Yeah, yeah I, you know, in several ways. I'm sure Randy will talk about landowner subsidies. Well, you know, they're definitely, uh, for one thing, they're getting subsidized by using our land. We don't want them to. And that's a big subsidy. But another thing that's huge, and a lot of people don't realize this, for some reason, uh, we all know why, I guess, but Congress back in the 80s passed a law that said that tar sands oil is technically not oil, so they would not have to pay into the emergency spill fund. <laughs> so they get the ship the hardest and the dirtiest oil to clean up clear across our country, and yet they're not charged that eight cents a barrel that domestic oil companies have to pay into the emergency spill fund. So that means if they spill and they get tired of cleaning up, the good old taxpayers are going to pick up the tap for the rest of it. Plus, the oil goes to Port Arthur, Texas, which is a tax-free export zone. So they pay no taxes there either. So let's just say Congress has given them somewhat of a sweetheart deal. <laughs> I also wanted to point out that there was an analysis done uh, by DTN, it's a media network uh, for agricultural uh, folks, does a lot of markets and stuff a few years ago. Um, I think it was uh, Todd Neely was the, was the individual uh, reporter that did this analysis. And it basically, at that time, and these subsidies no longer exist, but was comparing oil subsidies to ethanol subsidies, ethanol being the ones that, that had mostly been stripped away at this point. Um, and it was, it was astounding at the long list of, of subsidies, uh, many of them which come from the early 1900s uh, that, that are still in place today, and, and of course there's been a lot of new ones added over the years, but um, it, was, it was on the conservative side somewhere in the tune of $100 billion a year. So um, check out that DTN study sometime. It, it really breaks it down one by one and has links and everything to source it. I'm a mom, and I've been told that there's a little munchkin over here that has a question, and I didn't see your hand, and so I apologize. But in the mom and me, feel free, little one. Um, my question is, why do they have to use a pipe? Because they could just use trucks and bo boats. It's more eco-friendly. Does anybody want to answer that question? <laughs> The really good question is why do they have to use a pipe because they use could use trucks, trains, and boats. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the reason that I would want you to know about that is that almost every decision that a big oil company makes is about money. And the reason they want to use a pipe and they wanted to put it across Nebraska land and run it right down the middle of our country to go from a different country to what Mr. Thompson just said was a foreign trade zone where they won't pay any tax here and they won't have to pay much money for the land is because they will make more money. 
it's not about safety, it's about selfishness. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to pass this over to Ken to close, uh, but I also just want to thank everybody for constantly showing up. This is what will stop the pipeline, is the citizen power that is in this room. Um, please make sure to take a yard sign, take some postcards, um, and we'll stick, stick around to answer any questions that you guys might have afterwards, but I'll leave it to Ken to close. Thanks. Well, as I said when I introduced Senator Whitehouse, today's all about vision and courage and leadership. It's all about finding practical solutions that, and the fact there are practical solutions out there. Um, and I guess there's three things that I wanted to talk about. First of all, there's legislation in the Nebraska legislature that would help uh, make renewable energy more possible. That's LB 965. Contact your senator. Ask them to vote for LB 965. Secondly, OPBD is currently doing a, work, a series of workshops on their energy future. I encourage you to get out there and go to those, those sessions. And thirdly, get involved in the candidacies of the people up here on the stage. Um, particularly, I want to talk about Dave Domina. And uh, if you heard him speak, you had to be impressed. And the fact is, we have, we have a legitimate chance of electing a real statesman. And Nebraska has a history of people who are statesmen who went to Washington. People like William Jennings Bryan, and George Norris, and Jim Exxon, and Bob Carey. We need to have Dave Dominic go to Congress, too. money that's going to try and prevent that from happening. And so we all got to get involved in his campaign. Do whatever you can. I know Graham's working on his campaign. Talk to Graham. See what you can do. Wherever you can, however you can get in touch, however you can get involved. But he's really, the fact that he's standing up for the issues that we care about, that he's caring, that he stands up for real people and the things that, that matter to us, by golly, that's a breath of fresh air. <laughs> Involved in Dave Domino's campaign, let's get him get him elected to the United States Senate. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming again. There's more cookies, yard signs, postcards. We'll turn the music back on. Thanks guys. We'll be here to answer any questions soon. Thank you, Senator Fogg from Iowa.